epic Stattle One speedruns of statistics. Brian Stevens versus Chapter Five: The Standard Deviation as a Ruler and the Normal Model. Begin. The first thing we want to understand is how to calculate a z-score. So the formula for a z-score is the observation, which this represents something like your height or a score on a test. It's a singular observation where your height might be 75 inches or your score on a test might be a 90. This is the observed value. We are going to subtract from this the mean. So the mean is going to be the average of the distribution. And this is represented here by mu. So we're going to take the difference between the observation and the mean to get the differences between them. We're then going to take this difference and standardize it by the standard deviation of the population, which is sigma. So when you think about a z-score, think about this. All we're doing here is we're taking a difference and then standardizing that difference. And let's see this in action right here. We could take and ask someone their height. Maybe they say, I am 75 inches tall. If they are 75 inches tall, we need to know the mean for the distribution, which is the average of the distribution. It would look something like this right here, where the center of the distribution is. And maybe the mean of the dis distribution is 69. And now we need to know the standard deviation of the distribution, which is how far out the values are spread. And the standard deviation might be something like three. So all we're gonna do is take this difference of six and divide it by three, and this gives us a z-score of two. So what is a z-score of two? A z-score of two means that the observation was two standard deviations above the mean. Notice here that we are just taking the difference of 75 minus 69 and then putting it in terms of standard deviations. All a z-score is is a difference standardized by how many standard deviations it is above or below the mean. Now, a big thing we can do with this is we can do the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And this is a big thing to understand right here. So let's draw out our normal curve. So here we go. Here is our normal curve. And let's draw a little bit better of a line right there. There we go. So we're going to use this curve right here and draw in the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Remember, at the center of the curve, we do have the mean. So this is where the mean would go. And then we are gonna go up three standard deviations. There are more than three standard deviations on the curve. You could go out four, five, six, but 99.7% of the data will be contained within these three standard deviations. So usually we don't talk about further than three, especially when graphing it. So the mean is at the center of the curve, as we already mentioned. And then when we go up, we'd go up by one standard deviation. So that's just one standard deviation up and this is just one standard deviation up again, and this is the third standard deviation up on the curve. Things can be more than three standard deviations away, but they'd definitely be outliers at that point. So what is the 68, 95, 99.7 rule? When we talk about how many standard deviations things are apart, things within plus or minus one standard deviations would encompass 68% of the data. If you notice, I'm just putting down here what's called the standard normal curve on the bottom, which is going to be the z-scores. So these observations are within plus or minus one standard deviation. So let's make sure we know the context here. Here's the normal curve. Let's put this a tiny bit. That's right at a good spot. This is the normal curve right here with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And I'm also going to put some context. I'm going to use the same context we used earlier for the normal curve with a mean of 69 and a standard deviation of three. So with this, let's plot these numbers down below to talk about some context. If we're talking about people's heights, we would say that 68% of people's heights are between 66 inches and 72 inches. 68% of people's heights are between 66 inches and 72 inches, according to the normal model. And that's what the 68 means on the normal curve. Next, we get to 95, and we do the same thing here. We would go out two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above. And now let's look at what it means in context for 95% of the data to be contained within plus or minus two standard deviations. We would have here that 95% of people's heights according to the normal model is contained between 63 inches and 75 inches. And that's according to the normal model. Next we go to the 99.7 and we're gonna do the same thing right here. That 99.7% of observations, 
we were to ask people their heights, would be contained between plus or minus three standard deviations above or below the mean. And in context, this would be 99.7% of heights are expected to be between 60 inches and 78 inches. So you can see right here, we're just talking about where is the data contained? What percent of data do we expect between certain numbers on this curve? And this is the empirical rule, 68, 95, 99.7. But there's one step further we can take it. Let's talk about if 68% is between negative one and positive one, what is total outside? The total amount of area outside would be 32. We're just subtracting from 100. And with 32 total outside, that would leave 16% on either side. I'm just taking that 32 and dividing it by half. So if you notice right here, 68% inside, 32% total, 16 on either side. Let's do the 95. If 95% 95 is contained inside, then 5% is total outside. So all of this, both of these arrows right here would be five. And double check your work by going across the whole thing. You should get 100 because I'm gonna write 2.5 here and I'll make that five look a little bit better. 2.5 right here and 2.5 right here. So that's 2.5%. And that's the percent of area above two and percent of area below negative two. Important to know what these numbers represent. 99.7 is between negative three and positive three, meaning 0.3 I'm just subtracting from 100 is outside of that. So that would leave just half of that which is gonna be 0.15%, a very small percentage. And that's why we usually don't go further out on this curve because so little of the area would be even further out than these numbers. So that is the area above positive three and the area below negative three. Now we can do some questions right here. Some questions could ask, uh, what percent of individuals do we expect to have a height above 66 inches? If you've done this drawing, which is something I I suggest doing on the test, you would know 66 inches has a z-score of negative one. And look, you can go right across these arrows this way and you can figure out that 68 plus 16 is 84. You could also ask yourself if we're gonna say above 66 inches, then what percent is below? And you'll notice that 16% is below. And if 16% is below uh, 66 inches, then we would get that 84% is above. There's a lot of ways to solve this and a lot of ways to figure it out, but being able to draw this and understand what's going on is key. So next we get to the Z-score as a ruler. If you notice, we can change the context of the bottom one. This is always what I suggest drawing out on the test, having your standard normal curve. And the standard normal curve is the one I've drawn in blue right here because the numbers are always the same. It's a ruler for all data and then we can give it context, like your score on a test, let's say it's a really hard test, and the test score uh, had a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And you tell your parents you're so excited because you made an 80, and your parents are like, why? Why are you excited that you made an 80? And you would say to them, my test score was three standard deviations above the mean. Maybe this is like an organic chem test. And yeah, if you made an 80 on that, I've, I, I never took organic chem, but I imagine it'd be very difficult. So in this instance, the z-score of three means your three standard deviations above the mean, and we can solve right there. We would just go 50, 60, 70, 80, and we now know the observation. If you had another test, and this test, let's say, had a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of four, there's less variation, and you made a 92, you'd still have the same z-score. If you notice 92 is in the same spot, you're still three standard deviations above the mean. And in this test, if you made an 80, you would have made the average. So z-scores can be used to compare observations on distributions. It's kind of a ruler for how far above or below the mean you are. But one important thing to know is we need to make sure that the data is normal. So we have normal probability plots to do this. One way of checking normality is with the normal probability plot. So let's see right here that we have two distributions. We have distribution that is pretty normal and we have a distribution that is not normal, it's heavily skewed. The normal probability plot, a good way to remember what it is, is to read it backwards. A plot that tells you the probability that something is normal. Just remember, normal probability plot. A plot that tells you the probability that something is normal. And how does it tell you if something is normal? Well, if it follows the red line, just follow the red line right here, it's pretty normal. If it does not follow the red line, which you know is this one does not follow the red line, there's our line, 
and this one is not following it. These dots are going way off the red line. That's an indication that it is not normal. So when you look at this histogram right here, pretty normal with the bell-shaped curve, unimodal and symmetric. Those are the two things that make something normal, unimodal and symmetric. And then we have right here that it follows this line in the middle. It might be hard for you to see because I've drawn over it, but there is a red line going through the center of this graphic and the dots pretty much follow it. These dots do not follow the red line at the center of their graphic. So we would not conclude that this is normal. We'd have evidence it is not normal. Now we get to the goodness of fit test, which is right below here. The goodness of fit test, if you notice, has a p-value. So the p-value right here is going to tell us whether we should reject or fail to reject the null. Now the null for these tests is that the data is normal. So I want you to think about this. The null is that the data is normal. If the p-value is low, reject the null. This p-value is high. It's higher than 0.05. 0.05 is when we reject the null. Just think of 0.05 as a limbo bar. If you go underneath 0.05, you reject the null. So here we do not reject the null. So we're good. Pretty normal, it looks like. Over here, the p-value, and you know it's a p-value because it says prob right there. So always look for prob for p-values. We would reject the null. And think about this. This one looks super not normal up top. The normal probability plot is not following the red line. It's very kind of bent. And here, the p-value is very low. So all of these results right here would have us conclude that we have evidence of non-normality. So we need to make sure things are normal before we start using z-scores. Z-scores only really apply to normal data. You can calculate them, but think back to earlier chapters. If the data is normal, we use the mean and standard deviation. If data is skewed, we use the median and IQR. So using mean and standard deviation would not be proper because these they're going to be inflated for this data. You can see the mean right here, and also the standard deviation would also be skewed due to the outliers. Speaking of outliers, let's go back up here and talk where outliers begin. When we have outliers, we generally think of them at at or above three standard deviations above or below the mean. So these are kind of your more extreme outliers right here. So things that are outliers are definitely at or above three standard deviations above or below the mean. But when you think about this, especially in terms for heights, let's change the context here just a little bit back to height. Remember, we can do this if we write this out on our test. I would do this on my scratch paper when the test starts. And I would suggest this to students to draw out something like this. So then you can do work after the test starts because you can't come in with notes, but you can work on stuff during the test with what you know. So I would put here, the heights of individuals we started with, and we had 69 inches was the mean. And let's put this up here. 69 is the mean and three is the standard deviation. And I want you to think about the heights of individuals right here. When is someone unusually tall or unusually short? And by unusual, we just mean pretty far away from the average. And if somebody is six feet tall, that's not that unusual. That's one standard deviation above the mean. If someone is six foot three, that's kind of unusual. That's two standard deviations above the mean. But if someone is six foot six, that's very unusual. You'd be like, well, that person's very tall and they'd be in the upper 0.15% of individual's heights. But down here at the bottom, you'll see also the same thing that when you get to five foot three and five feet, you've got negative two and negative three. So these are the more unusual heights because they're further away from the mean. Being an outlier just means you're further away from the mean. So when you think about this, we can also think about percentiles right here. When it comes to percentiles on the curve, we would have that the 97.5th percentile would be right here. So these heights represent the 97.5th percentile. What do we mean by percentile? It's the area below that point. So there is 97.5% of the data below here. Very important to understand where percentiles are and percentiles are the area below a point. So this would be the 84th percentile and the middle of the curve, as you may guess, is the 50th percentile, the 16th percentile, the 2.5th percentile, the 0.15th percentile, um, 1.5 percentile. So understanding percentiles is also very important, and outliers are in the extreme percentiles, either in the very high percentiles or the very low percentiles on the curve. When we get to positive and negative z-scores, we need to go back to our first example right here, where we were calculating someone's height and their z-score for their height. What if we were to change this right here to 63 inches? If we have 63 inches, then we'd get negative six, and we'd have negative two. So z-scores tell us if something is above or below the mean. So when something has a positive z-score, it's above the mean. 
When something has a negative z-score, it's below the mean. And when something has a z-score of zero, it's right on the mean. So you can kind of understand where things are on the curve by their z-score. The closer to zero, the closer to the mean. Positive above the mean, negative below the mean. Great understanding right there. The normal model and z-scores, once again, the standard normal model is a great thing to draw out here. You'll notice that the standard normal model is something that can apply to all of these. We can kind of keep our drawing right here with the standard normal model and keep the z-scores on it so we can always have context, and then we can draw our numbers below it. This is a great way to solve a lot of questions. Once again, we need to make sure that the data is normal. Z-scores do not apply if you try to fit a normal curve on data that's not normal. If we have here this curve that is not normal and we try to fit a normal curve on top of it, we might get something that looks like this. If you notice, it just doesn't work. The data would go outside of it and we would not be properly explaining it with the z-scores. So only use the normal model when the normal model applies. How do you know if it applies? Here is the understanding right here. And we re reviewed it earlier, talking about the normal probability plot, the goodness of fit test, and the curve is unimodal and symmetric. Make sure to review those. A lot of people often wonder about the David M. Lane applet and how we would use that on the test. So here's an example question. We'll zoom in just a little bit on it so you can see. A test has a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 10. Test scores are normally distributed. Good to know that they're normal so we can use the normal curve. What percent of students would you expect to make below a 70? Now, if you notice, we have the area above a 90 on this curve. Automatically start checking things. Do we have the mean? Do we have the standard deviation? And we could also do z-scores, so make sure you know how to convert between z-scores. But we have above a 90 here, which you might think this graphic, how could we use this if it's the area above a 90? But remember, start plotting in your z-scores. I would go to any one of these curves, and I would start putting in the numbers on it in z-scores. If we want the area above, a 70, then, oh, it's below a 70, excuse me. If we want the area below a 70, then we would need to plot the following, and you'll notice it's gonna look very similar to what we have already done. So you might immediately identify by drawing this out that, wait a minute, the area below a 70 is below negative one. And if above positive one, is 15.87%, then below negative one would be the same area. So this is actually the answer right here. This is the answer to the question. Oftentimes we make it a little more difficult on the test where we might ask you the area above 70. So let's change this from the area below 70 to above 70. So if you wanna do the area above 70, we're almost there. If you understood and you got to the point where you said, wait a minute, that would be the same area below 70, which is 15.87 due to the symmetry right there. Well, then wouldn't the area above 70 just be one minus that? Wouldn't it be one minus that? It's the remaining area over here on this side. So now we would just simply take this area below 70, which is 15.87, subtract it from one, which is basically 100%. And now we have the area above 70. So kind of changing the question to make it a little more difficult here, and there's a lot of these to practice and understand, but the biggest thing is if you generally know how to use the applet, we might show you pictures, and then you would have to use a question like this and to solve for the answer right here being 0 0.8413. So it's important to understand how to use the applet. Make sure you do the homeworks, do the quizzes, and practice, and good luck on this chapter.